off. Good evening and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight for yet another virtual event. Uh, this one is on climbing Mount St. Helens, which will be a safety clinic with Portland Mountain Rescue. I'm Liz Craig with The Mountain Shop. And tonight we are joined by, by Michael Horsch. And did I say your last name right? That works. Close enough. Close. Um, and he's a volunteer with PMR, Portland Mountain Rescue. And he's going to review the gear you might need, the skills you should learn and practice, and what it takes to get to the top of this National Volcanic Monument. Um, if you have questions for Michael throughout the presentation about climbing Mount St. Helens, the gear, clothing, preparation, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A function of Zoom or send them in the chat and I will keep track of them. We'll stop periodically to address those questions. And with that, I will pass things over to you, Michael. Uh, thank you, Liz. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Mountain Shop for doing this. Um, there have been our partners with PMR for many years. Um, and in fact, I rented stuff from Mountain Shop like 40 years ago when I first climbed Mount Hood uh, when they were over on Broadway Boulevard. So, and that was the days of hemp rope, in fact. So, you know, I'm an old timer. Um, tonight's, uh, tonight's talk is about Mount St. Helens. And I'm assuming that this is to a uh, more of a, a novice mountaineer. Um, so we're going to be talking about some very basic things. Um, um, I was alive when Mount St. Helens blew up. In fact, I was in college and uh, in Portland. So I, before it blew up, um, we would see these spurts of ash periodically for weeks and months before it actually had the Big Bang. Although I wasn't in actual Portland when it happened, I came back a few days later and Portland was covered with ash. And you think of ash as like from a fireplace, but no, ash is like sand. And Portland various, got up to an inch or two of sand in various places. And it was hard to move, you couldn't sweep it. Um, so the fire department would uh, loan out their old fire hoses to these huge parking lots of stores and malls and they would take these huge fire hoses and uh, wash away the sand from the city and um and i did some of that i sell to a, a local church i helped them uh clear out their parking lot but anyway that was a long time ago now now mount st helens is um shorter of course um there are people who've climbed it before it blew up but they're all much older than me uh they're still around though it's a beautiful climb um, and it's a relatively easy climb compared to the other volcanoes um, in the Cascades. And um, there's some beautiful views of it. There's Mount Hood in the background. Um, here's the summit. Uh, it's a friend of mine, Paige there. She's about 10 feet from the rim. The rim usually has a cornice, so you never wanna go that close to the rim without being attached to a rope. Over in the left, you see Mount Rainier. Right behind Page are the Goat Rocks, um, some of you may be familiar with in Washington. And uh, there's Spirit Lake, in fact, over to the left below Mount, Mount Rainier. So um, you wanna get to the top. Well, how do you get to the top? Well, you need your legs to do that. And you can't just decide to drive someday. Um, you need to prepare. So um, how I prepare for a mountain climb is I start doing harder and harder hikes with a heavier and heavier pack. So for example, you might do Angel's Rest with a 10 pound pack and next week maybe um, Hamilton Mountain with a 15 pound pack and gradually going up until you hit Mount Defiance with maybe a 30 pound pack. When you do that, you know you're ready. Um, you don't need much more than um, than strong legs, although hiking poles are highly recommended. I have some, I have a story of this old guy who was really having a rough time getting to the top, but when a friend loaned him his hiking poles, this old guy just started taking off. So it turns out that hiking poles probably take five to 10% of the weight off your legs and they really can help you get up to the top. The comments down here about avalanche, that's of course just for winter. Um, in the summer, you don't have to worry about avalanche or snow travel although weather is always an issue. Before I climb a mountain, I usually start looking at the weather maybe a week in advance, maybe in two weeks, depending on the mountain. And so I know what kind of 
clothing I'm going to need, what kind of gear I'm going to need, depending on what the forecast is. But of course, you can't rely on the forecast completely. Um, here's some of the issues here, some of the stuff you should bring along. Um, but for summer, uh, there are some nuances here. In the shoulder seasons, in the fall and in the spring, you need more than this. Um, one time I climbed up in the autumn and it had frozen the night before. So the tiny snow patches they had were just ice. And I was pretty frustrated. I got up most of the way and I realized I couldn't go any further on the ice with my hiking boots. But I realized that a little bit over to my right, somebody had gone up in spikes and created just enough of a uh, pocket in the ice I could keep going. So now I always carry micro spikes if I'm in the shoulder season, spring or, or autumn when there might've been freezing the night before. Now, of course, I could have waited a couple hours for the ice to thaw, but that would have been, uh, that would not have been good. Um, and let's talk about clothing for a minute. I usually carry two pairs of gloves, a, a light layer and a thick layer. It's almost always cold and windy up on top. So no matter how warm or sweaty you are down below, you're almost always gonna to have to put on a layer or two when you get up above. Uh, generally speaking, unless it's a hot day, I usually wear a long underwear with convertible pants on. So in the morning when you're leaving early, it's cold. And then as you warm up, I can zip my legs off. And then at the top when it's cold again and windy and you're not working anymore, then I can zip my legs, legs right back on. Um, everybody needs a wind layer. Um, strange to say, uh, the last time I was hypothermic was in the middle of the summer on the about 9,000 feet on Mount Jefferson because of the strong winds. And all these volcanoes can have strong winds. And so no matter what time of year it is, you need a, a rain or wind layer because um, no one knows what the wind's gonna be like on the summer. Um, and that time on Jefferson, when I was getting hypothermic, my words are starting to slur, my fingers became difficult to quite use. But as soon as I put on a wind layer and ate and drank, yeah, after about 15 minutes, I was good to go. Um, sunglasses, of course, and water. Well, I usually take about three liters. Some people get more on, get by on less, some more. Water, of course, is somewhat heavy, um, but that's kind of what works for me, three liters. And there's always an issue, are you gonna be in freezing weather, whether you should use um, a camelback or a tube type water reservoir, because if it freezes, then you're really stuck. So I, I don't use a water reservoir in winter time or when there's a chance that um, the water may be, or it may be freezing. Um, I've been with climbers whose water tubes have frozen and it's not a happy scene. For winter climbing or even in spring, um, since it can, freeze up a top, um, you always have to have a crampons. Um, even if it's warm down below, if it freezes up above, you're just on a sheet of ice. So I've, sometimes I've worn crampons for the last 2000 feet. Similarly with snowshoes, if um, there's been recent snow, um, I've also worn snowshoes all the way to the summit as well. And so all these things just depend on what um, the condition of the snow is in wintertime. Of course, that doesn't apply so much in the middle of summer. And then the next thing is permits. Uh, that's one of the biggest issues for me. In fact, now I only pretty much climb in the free uh, unlimited uh, permit season from November 1st to March 31st. Um, otherwise, you can see the cost and the limited number of, um, of climbers. And it's, it's pretty difficult to get a permit, but um, they are available. Um, any questions so far of, um, that I've talked about um, gear or clothing or, or, or what have you? Yeah, we haven't had um, any questions. We did have someone comment that the limits have been reduced now due to COVID. Um, so these are the updated limits. So what they did is they decreased the April 1 to May 14. It might've been, I think, 500, now it's down to three, but they increased from 100 to 110, the May 15 to October 31st bracket. So um, it turns out 500 climbers um, on the mountain for Mother's Day is just, 
I don't know if you know what Mother's Day is like on Mount St. Helens, but everybody is supposed to wear a dress, men and women alike. And so it's quite a, um, quite a spectacle, Mother's Day on Mount St. Helens. I've never been there, but I've heard quite a few stories about everybody's dresses on that day. Um, we had someone ask, does a permit allow, how many people does a permit allow for? Each person needs their own permit, um, maximum of 12 in any one group. Yes. Um, and then we had someone ask, how do you know when to use micro spikes versus crampons? If we have crampons, are there situations where micro spikes are preferable? Well, crampons definitely in the winter time. Um, that one time I wore crampons all the way to the sun, but that was thick ice. We're in the middle of winter and, and I couldn't have, um, it was, it was thick all, all the way. But in the shoulder season, when there's a, a light layer of snow that froze the night before, I think micro spikes would be fine. I mean, this, this is when it's, there's no snow until like the last thousand feet. That's when I would probably think that micro spikes would be fine. Okay. Um, but crampons would, is there any reason why you wouldn't just take crampons? Um, no reason, no reason except for the weight and well, actually a little bit. Um, I can stumble with the crampons. You only know, stick out an inch and I poke myself with them. Sometimes I've torn my pants with them before when I didn't quite step right. Um, so the crampons are not actually completely benign. They are required or they're necessary often, but I, I never wear crampons unless I have to because uh, I have self-injury issues. <laughs> Um, so sometimes they're overkill, but yeah, yeah. they would theoretically work where you might also need my Yes, they will work at any time. That's for um, sure. Great. We had someone ask, could you elaborate on using the winter route versus the summer route? And around what time of year does it switch over? And is there any time that they overlap? Okay, so that's coming up ahead. You're, um, you're okay. anticipating me. Perfect. Um, so hold that thought. Uh, and then is there ever a time, do you ever see a situation where more a more technical type of snowshoe do well as far as taking the place of micro spikes or even crampons? And I think you kind of touched on this earlier. Well, you know, crampons are for ice and snowshoes are for snow. And so when you're, when the snowshoes are in, so you're not post holding and sticking in your foot, a, a, a foot or two, every time you take a step, that's very tiring. So um, in fact, when I, I carry snowshoes every time in the winter time, but I usually dump them about a third of the way up if I realize that I don't really need them. So up on the ridge, there's a lot of rocks. I, I, when I realize I don't need my, if I think I'm not gonna need my snowshoes based on the conditions, I'll, I'll, I'll drop my crampons off behind a rock and, and take off and pick them up on the way back. Um, and yes, uh, crampons with heel lifters are amazing for old people like me because uh, I can't stretch my calves as much as I used to. Even though the climb isn't really steep, uh, those heel lifters, to, so I don't have to stretch my calves so much are really a boost for me, but really any snowshoe would work. Totally. We have both at the mountain shop and like if you ask for the ones with the heel riser, they'll give them to you. There's no cost difference as long as we have them available. I would always take the heel risers if there's no cost difference. Yeah, that exactly. Exactly, a slam dunk. <laughs> um, okay, cool. I think that's all the questions for now. If you want to keep rolling. Um, so somebody asked about the roots. So the Monitor Ridge route starts at uh, Klamath Bivouac. Um, it's po the Forest Service post when Clamour's bivouac is open. That means it's snow free. It's uh, closed now and it opens up sometime in May, usually, depending on the snow year. And um, it cl uh, cl that route closes down sometime middle November. So mid May to mid November is usually the Monitor Ridge route, which starts at Clamour's bivouac. It's a higher elevation, which is why it uh, is not open during the winter. Monitor Ridge Route, it's called Monitor because there is a monitor that monitors the activity of the mountain in terms of earthquakes and tremors and things like that. 
But in addition, there's these posts, big uh, 10 foot round posts that uh, are all along the way. So it's kind of hard to get lost. So it's only two main uh, routes up, the winter one and the summer one. And both of them are pretty busy. So usually finding the route is not a problem because there's just so many people above you and behind you. However, one problem is in the winter time, which is a much longer hike because the starting elevation is much lower, um, if clouds move in or fog moves in, it can be hard to find where you were. Um, now, often, as I said, there's a track that you can, uh, you know, a snowshoe track or a foot track that you can monitor, but it, late in the year, there's tracks everywhere. So in the winter time, it's, it can be quite, um, difficult to find your way down. In fact, the last time I was up there with Portland Mountain Rescue is because of a lost climber. He'd come down somewhere else than he wanted to, didn't show up that night, so we went up in the morning, but he was able to come out on his own without much help. In fact, there was a rescue just recently um, that Portland Mountain Rescue was not involved with, um, but I don't know the details much about that rescue. Um, I think it was more of an injury than a lost climber. Um, so in the winter time, I would it would be recommended if you had some kind of GPS device to leave a few breadcrumbs for yourself, um, uh, so you can find the proper way down. Uh, so when I'm climbing, no matter what mountain I'm climbing, I'm always turning around. You know, at least every 20, 30 minutes, look behind me and see what things look like. Because I could tell you they look a lot different one way versus the other way. Um, now in the summertime, fog and clouds are less common and um, the route is shorter, so it's less chance to get lost and you can follow those wood posts pretty much all the way down to the dirt trail. Uh, but in the wintertime, there's no such thing and it starts looking very similar. In fact, when I first started climbing Mount Hood in the winter, uh, Mount, uh, Mount St. Helens in wintertime, when I get up there, I'd say, now, how did we even get up here? Um, because it all looks like <laughs> there's no obvious route when you're up there. So in the wintertime, it's best to uh, keep track of things, but that's less necessary in the summertime. Um, here's a little map. Um, hopefully you can see my cursor. Marble Mountain Snow Park is the winter starting park point right there. And the Climber's Bivouac is the summer starting route. Climber's Bivouac is a small parking area with a porta potty. Um, and it's a small parking area. Um, so even though I tell people to start around 7 a.m. Um, on, a, on, um, on a busy weekend, you might want to get there a little bit early. I was there on the 1st of November, this few months ago, 1st of November, the first day of the free climbing unlimited permit season. And I knew it was gonna be busy because it was a great weekend. And I got there maybe quarter after six and I had to walk a quarter mile to the trailhead. A quarter mile is not that far. But for those people who didn't realize that it would be a busy weekend, the cars were, I don't know how far they went, but they went a long ways past me. One climber said he thought he had to hike a mile just to get to the trailhead. So on a, on a nice, on a really nice day, you might want to get there a little bit early so you can at least get somewhere near the trailhead parking. Now the winter, that's not an issue. Marble Mountain Snow Park is very large, very large. I've never seen it fill up. Of course, it also services snowmobiles and Nordic skiers as well, but I've, I've never seen that parking lot full. That also has a porta potty, by the way. Here's a little bit of closer view of the routes. The climb is bivouac on the red on the left and the, the Marble Mountain Snow Park. And you can see there's at least an extra mile, at least a mile uh, both ways on the, on the winter route. And it's, um, it's almost a thousand feet lower in elevation. So the winter route definitely is a more strenuous uh, climb than the summer route. Although as you can see up on top, they merge. Both of them come out on the rim, but the actual summit is a little bit to the left, but since it's about a quarter mile away, and by the time you get to the rim, most people are tired. Most people don't actually bother to get up to the absolute summit. They're happy getting to the rim and calling it a day. 
here's the uh, stats on uh, on the winter one. And here's similarly for the summer one. So let's talk about it. So from the climber's bivouac, you're gonna walk for about a mile, no, sorry, for about an hour before on a regular trail through the woods. It's, it's an easy, a gradual climb. You'll eventually run into the Lewitt Trail. And then shortly after that, you'll leave the trail and enter the boulder, the lava flow. And then you'll see that's when you start seeing the, the posts, these uh, large posts in the, uh, is the route up to the summit. And you'll follow this boulder uh, ridge most of the way up. And this boulder ridge requires use of your hands. There are areas that you don't need to use your hands, but a significant amount of hand work. So many people use uh, wear a helmet so that they actually slip uh, they don't bang their head up very much. And lava is sharp. And so have to be careful with uh, use of your hands so you don't actually get little cuts in them uh, on the way up. It's not particularly steep, but going over boulders is requires the use of hands. Um, um, so that's, that's that um, when people are run into that, sometimes they they're not often prepared that, oh my gosh, I gotta actually climb over rocks and boulders and around and over. Well, such that's the case. Now in the winter time, you don't have to do that. It goes up a different route and there's no climbing over any boulders because everything's covered in snow. So it's a nice uh, straight route up. And being up there is quite beautiful. Here's a few pictures of it. Um, the climb. Um, I put 7 a.m. AM in here because that's a, a common climb, a time to climb, but it's not set in stone, of course. If it's going to be really busy, you might want to start sooner. Um, if the weather's looking better but not quite good at the start, you might start a little bit later. Uh, the problem in the winter time is that you have fewer sunlight hours, and normally you want to get back to your car by, by dark. Um, in the summertime, that's less of an issue. You can see the other comments here. So this is a winter climb here. Looks like the lower man has snowshoes on and above them they are on skis. Um, but this is one of the issues when uh, some clouds or fog comes in, you know, it's kind of hard to tell where you're going. And of course you can tell it's sunny because they have shadows around them. But even on a sunny day, um, clouds and fog can um, come by periodically. Climbing any cascade volcano has, has similar issues. Hypothermia, as we talked about earlier, I've had even that in the summertime. Avalanches. So people should not be climbing St. Helens in the winter unless they have had avalanche training. Well, what about those people who haven't? Well, it turns out you can go partway. I think one of the prettiest snowshoes I know of is uh, the winter climbing trail after a fresh snowfall and under blue skies. Um, you can probably go up about a third of the way up the mountain. You can definitely get it above tree line. As long as you stay on the ridge, there's no avalanche danger on the ridge. Um, and you could probably get at least a third of the way up the mountain. My wife have done, and I have done that a couple of times when we weren't ready to climb, but we just wanted to get out for a snowshoe. So for people without avalanche awareness and they want to get out there, get out there. Um, but just don't leave the ridge. Um, ridges, uh, avalanches don't happen on ridges. They have happen in gullies. And as you follow the winter route, you'll see that you follow the ridge, you know, a large uh, for a significant period of time. And if you don't leave the ridge, you can have a great time and a beautiful snowshoe partway up Mount St. Helens. And in fact, for the Nordic skiers, one of the, my favorite Nordic skis is leaving Marble Mountain Snow Park and heading east on the road over to the Lahar. And that is just a spectacular place. It's starting to grow back with trees now, but it used to be just a plain of snow in the mountain in front of you on a sunny day. Um, it's a, one of my particular places to go on Nordic skis. 
Anyway, for those who don't have avalanche awareness, there's still plenty to do in the wintertime. You can partially climb uh, Mount St. Helen or any of the Cascade volcanoes, for that matter, uh, partway without worrying about avalanches. Um, abrasive wind-blown ash. Well, that brings up Mount Jefferson last year, two years ago, um, where I got, where I got uh, hypothermic. There's also ash on Mount, Saint, uh, on Mount Jefferson. So the, the wind was blowing so hard, I felt like I was being sandblasted. Now I've never had that on Mount St. Helens, but it could happen on any of the Cascade volcanoes. This is just your standard um, advice, stay away from edges. Cornices can extend much further than you think they can. Uh, and it's surprising how close people get to the chorus. I have to look away sometimes. I just can't, I can't watch. <laughs> but if you stand back 10 feet, generally you're pretty darn safe. Um, yeah, that's a reasonable, that's a reasonable uh, guideline. Oh, this is another thing I forgot to mention. So when under gear in wintertime, don't forget your glissade pants. You know, glissading is fun. I've glissaded down St. Helens many a time, but it's not always available. It's, the temperature has to be right. The snow has to be right. If it's icy, you can't stop. And if it's too soft, you won't go anywhere. But glissading is hard on pants. So I wear cheap pants that are wearing out um, um, because they'll ruin your cortex. And that's the other thing. You get really wet from glissading for an hour or two. Very fun, but you're quite wet when you're done. So you can only do it really on a, on a nice day when the sun's out and, and you don't want to freeze. Um, since I'm never the fastest one at the mountain, by the time I'm on my way down, I see everybody else's glissade shoots. So you, you know, it's hard to start to shoot yourself unless the snow is just right. But once several people have been on it, you've got to shoot down and you can take off. So that's always a lot of fun, as a matter of fact. I've already kind of covered this a little bit, uh, root finding, um, going down in the fog and the clouds. Um, I've already mentioned, considered and taken a few waypoints on a GPS. Um, footprints are good in the winter time, but not so much on Monitor Ridge because it's mostly rocky. Um, one time, in fact, I turned my group around uh, when it became just really a whiteout. We were maybe halfway up the winter route and we really couldn't see very much around us. Um, and also we had a few climbers who are going pretty slow. So I'm thinking, you know, what's my turnaround time? I wanna get back by dark and we have a hard time seeing. So, so that's one of the, that was a, one of the frustrating times that way we turned our group around because it just wasn't, it didn't make sense. We weren't gonna be able to get back to our cars by dark. Now, of course you always take headlamps anyway, but you're, you, you wouldn't choose to come back in the dark. And, and that brings up a good point about a turnaround time. Anytime you climb a mountain, you should have a time at which you decide to turn around no matter where you're at. Putting in how far it will take to get back, you know, what time is sunset, a little bit of a, um, a cushion there. Um, so yes, I ran into my turnaround time on Mount St. Helens in time when uh, we had a pretty, we had just had a slow party. And in addition, to, um, it was a wide out. So we weren't gonna see anything anyway. Here's one of the views looking down. Um, see, here is hard to tell where to go. Uh, I've done it enough that I don't think I would have a problem finding my way down, but GPS breadcrumbs are good things. Okay, let's stop there for a moment. Um, are there questions that people come up with? Perfect timing. I was just going to interrupt you with some questions. So <laughs> great minds think alike. Um, we had someone ask, what is avalanche danger in the shoulder season? Well, uh, one of my favorite websites is NWAC, Northwest Avalanche Center. And they're really good. During the wintertime, they give a forecast every single day on what the avalanche danger is. 
However, their, their forecasts are, are average. Now, what's the average for uh, avalanche danger, depending on whether you're above or below tree line? And we, we mountain climbers follow that site religiously. Um, but in the shoulder season, there's, um, I mean, NWAC doesn't start putting up um, bulletins until, well, until there's significant snowfall, which is usually sometime around Thanksgiving. And then they usually knock off right about now, right about mid, mid to late April, again, depending on what the snowpack is for that year. So generally speaking, there's no avalanche danger much before Thanksgiving because there's just not enough snow to avalanche. You know, it takes a fair amount of snow to do that. And the, the routes on Mount St. Helens are not that steep. I mean, there's some steep areas, um, so, Avalanche, avalanches only occur in avalanche terrain. They don't occur just because there's a lot of snow around. So for example, they don't occur on routes that are less than 20 degrees in, in, uh, in incline. So in shoulder season, we're not too worried about avalanches. In the, in the autumn, there hasn't been enough snow to build up to cause an avalanche. And in the spring, the snowpack has settled so much that um, uh, and the route is gradual enough that um, um, avalanches just don't happen late in the spring or early in the fall on Mount St. Helens. Cool. Did I answer that question? I think so, yeah. Um, I will say that I have seen a couple things posted on like Pacific Northwest Mountaineers and some of the Facebook groups out there. Um, it looked like there was a Winslab avalanche not on the route, but kind of off to the side of the route. It looked like it was like skier triggered. Um, so if you aren't hiking and you're skiing, just being aware of off the shoulders of the ridge of the route. Yeah, so there's an avalanche terrain. There is a there is a chute where avalanches typically occur on Mount St. Helens. It's off to the right as you're climbing up. Mm -hmm. But when you're on the ridge, that is just not a not a concern. In fact, right. I've seen the results of some avalanches up there in the gullies to the right. It's mm -hmm. kind of to the far right of the climber's trail. And so, no, tr tr um, staying out of avalanche terrain is an important thing. That's where avalanche awareness and taking an avalanche course helps you understand where what is safe and what is not safe. However, since we brought up avalanches, I must say that this is one of the most dangerous years there's ever been in America for avalanche deaths. Um, more people died this year in America from avalanches than in the past 50 years. Um, I don't think many of them were in the Cascades. Most of them were in the Rockies, but there is a lot of them. And, and people are thinking that people are just so tired of being pent up from COVID. They just wanted to get out despite dangerous conditions. In fact, these people who died were not novices. They'd all taken avalanche courses, but they... That's a whole separate issue of why people do things enter dangerous territory when they know better. There's all kinds of mental things that happen in people's heads when they see the fresh powder and they fail to uh, use their hard, hard gained knowledge about what not to do. And they do it despite that. That's a whole never, that's a whole nother talk about why <laughs> experienced avalanche people die yeah. in that yeah. was a terrible year. It was. Um, we had another question. Is there a recommended time to start heading up the worm flows route? And then another question that came through actually in an email to me before the event was why do people start climbing so early? Is there, they've been tracking a lot of climbers and seeing them start at daybreak. Um, do you want to give any explanation for that? Okay, so let's say you start at 7 a.m. And you're making pretty good time. So you're up there, let's say six hours, six hours. So what time is that? That's one o'clock. And then if it's a nice day, you wanna have a half, you wanna sit in the summit and enjoy the view and have a lunch. Um, what time is it now? Now it's uh, 1.30. And then you have to go down. And now going down takes not as much time. We'll say four hours. So now 1.30 is now almost 5.30. And then for Portlanders, it's an hour and a half drive to get back to town. And so uh, I wouldn't want to start any later than that. Um, and in fact, on a busy day, I'll even start earlier. 
And of course, in the wintertime, you just have a much smaller window of daylight hours. So in 7 a.m., it's actually dark in January when you're starting at 7 a.m. And it's dark and sunset, it's, you know, pretty much around, you know, before five. And so you have a much shorter window. And if, if somebody gets injured or has a problem, your, your, um, your cushion rapidly diminishes. Um, I guess that's, you know, it's not just as much of an issue in the summertime. Uh, and of course, I've seen people go up late in the day. This last November, I saw people going up late afternoon. And I asked them, you know, it's pretty late. I mean, I care about people. I don't want them to get stuck in the dark. And they say, oh, I'll turn around. <laughs> As important mountain risk, you are always looking at other climbers if we see unsafe activity or something that we don't think is right. So when, uh, when I see people doing things that concern me, I, I ask them. You know, it's pretty late and, not, you know, it's, you know, sunsets in two hours. <laughs> What's your plan? Maybe they're setting a fastest known time. They're just going to run up it. <laughs> Maybe I've um, beat that one to death. Okay. Uh, hey, it's a valid question. And especially if you're the one that might have to turn around and go back out. Yeah. Sometimes I want to get out the mountain fast. So I'm not, I don't have to see what happens. <laughs> Um, and then we had one other question about glacier travel on Mount St. Helens. Is there any concern with traveling over the Swift Glacier? It looks like you avoid it in the winter route picture. Yeah, there, the winter route is not a glacier. It's a snow field. So there's no actual glaciers that we cross. Okay. And so there's no issues about crevasses. So that's why people don't rope up. Um, even when it's really icy um, and you have crampons on and... Uh, and you have to be careful. Uh, it's probably safer not to rope up because if you fall, it's, un, it's pull, more than likely you're going to pull somebody else with you. So everybody pretty much climbs on their own. I've, I can't say I've ever seen a rope on Mount St. Helens. Okay. I think that answers all of our questions that we have pending for now. Okay. So what if things don't go well? Here's a little vignette about coming back and something bad happens because bad things happen no matter how safe you are no matter what the best gear you own um, things happen and so in this little vignette Debbie has injured her leg so now what happens you're, you're, it's late in the day, you're on your way back. You start at a good time, but still it's late in the day. Um, nearly every group I've ever been in has a leader, even if it's an informal leader or you know, no one actually says you're the leader. Uh, usually the person with most experience usually is the one who um, you know, directs the ship. And when something happens, Somebody has to organize things. That doesn't have to be the leader of the client. Maybe there's a, a, a medical person on board or, or somebody else who actually has more experience with injuries. But somebody has to help um, organize the, the team to help the, this injured person. And a large group, the leader can direct things and not be involved with, you know, hands-on, but if there's just a small team of two or three, everybody has to help out. The most important thing is safety um, is the place where you're at safe. Now, this isn't so much a problem in Mount St. Helens, but if a person falls on Mount Hood and they're underneath a ledge where there's rockfall or snowfall, that person needs to be moved before they can even be attended to. So first thing, of course, is to be sure everybody's safe and then attend to the, um, the victim, uh, whatever, try to figure out what, what is going on uh, and make sure everybody else is safe at the same time. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but um, leadership in stressful situations is, is something. I've been in situations where people uh, freeze up. They're not, um, it's frightening what's, what's, what has happened to your friend and you don't know what to do and the, your brain can become scrambled. 
whereas other people seem to be more cool under stress and can not uh, get uh, too anxious or excited and be able to take care of what needs to be done. Uh, everybody has different skills, it turns out. Here's our standard. Um, this is a national standard for how to take care of injured people. Scene assessment, as I mentioned, are we safe where we're standing? Are we in the middle of a, a rock fall or snowfall or next to a crevasse or whatever it might be? Um, we don't want more victims, one's enough. So first of all, are we okay where we're standing? And if not, we need to move. Um, safety, um, not just the person who's injured, but everybody else. Uh, let's say you're on a slope, it's kind of steep. So you would anchor yourself in with your ice axe, for example or kick out some uh, flat area with your boots. Um, and then you take, uh, you assess what the injuries are. Um, a sprained ankle, you might be able to tape the, the, you know, use your duct tape or your medical tape and tape that thing so it's more like a cast. And so a person could come down under their own power with some um, hiking poles and an immobile foot. Uh, that'd be a very reasonable thing to do. Um, if it's more a serious injury and they can't evacuate and they can't self-rescue, well, then um, now we have to figure out what to do. Um, and here's some questions to ask. Will everyone survive without a rescue? Maybe you can't get down tonight. Maybe, you're, maybe you've injured yourself so you can walk slowly, but you still can walk and you'll get out in the dark. Well, is that going to be a problem? If everybody has headlamps and the route is pretty clear, coming out in the dark is, you know, it's not a bad thing. In fact, you're probably going to get out faster if you do it yourself than if you wait for others to do it. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, let's say there's a bleeding problem. Uh, if you can't stop that bleeding, that's a life-threatening injury. Um, or it could be a medical issue. Uh, I'm an old dude. Potentially, I could have a heart attack up there. Um, and it uh, often comes back, if, can you get out by yourself or not? So one problem with Mount St. Helens is that reception is quite limited cell phone reception. Now, on the summit, I think I've gotten a few texts before and I probably sent a few texts, but down below, there is absolutely no service, certainly not in the forest and not a little above tree line either. You really are all by yourself in terms of phone coverage, unless you're nearly on the top of the mountain. So uh, if the person can't move and you don't have cell reception and your group is big enough, you will send a couple of people for help. Normally you would never send an individual by yourself. Normally you'd always send a team of two. Um, because again, there can be some issues about finding your way back to the vehicle and then driving to cell reception. Um, I've, been in a, I've been in a scenario where a person was badly injured. There was no cell reception. There were just two of us. I had to leave my wife, <laughs> ski for help, wait for the paramedics, then bring them back to her. Uh, that, was a, that was a very bad day. Um, I guess we'll go through some of these where we talked about cell phone. Personal locator beacons, PLBs, turns out they're monitored by the Air Force. I have one. Um, and they're satellite coverage. So as soon as I turn them on, the satellites pick them up and it's my PLB is um, registered with the Air Force. That's the standard. And they'll come looking for me because I won't turn it on unless it's a life-threatening emergency. Um, so that one is always monitored. In reach, they're, they're becoming more and more common. Um, in, in reach and spot are somewhat similar. Uh, you can alert friends and families that um, you need help. I've never seen a satellite phone in the Pacific Northwest. Those are more for more, more remote um, places. Uh, any questions about any of these items here? Um, we haven't had any questions about emergency signaling or on 
um, Mountain Rescue. We did have some prior to that, but I think we can save them for the end. They're not totally relevant to the current questions or the current topic. This picture down here is not from Mount St. Helens, it's from Mount Hood, and you can see the helicopter there. Helicopter rescues are, are always iffy. We don't have a dedicated helicopter to um, Mount Hood or Mount St. Helens or Mount Adams or even any of the three sisters. I mean, it's kind of, if they're available, they are. If they aren't, they aren't. So we can never count on them. And as in Portland Mount, Mount Rescue, we never do count on them. We hope for them on occasion, but we never can count on them because they're, they may be available or not. Um, which is different from Mount Rainier. The National Park System has dedicated helicopters. That's a little bit of difference of a national park. So Portland Mountain Rescue doesn't have primary responsibility for Mount St. Helens, so we go there only intermittently. And the last time I was up there was a lost climber when there was a lot of uh, rescue teams from the area to try to blanket the area with the searchers. Um, normally the volcano rescue team is, um, um, you does most of the rescues up there. Uh, other teams are called in when there's more, uh, they just need more, more bodies to uh, look. How long will it take? Well, let's go through a timeline. Let's go through the timeline that my wife needed rescuing. She got injured at noon. It took me an hour to get out to cell reception. It took um, half an hour to get um, an, uh, paramedics. They were on snowshoes. It took them two hours to get to her. But two people cannot rescue a woman who, uh, or a man who has a busted knee. And so we sat around for a couple more hours to wait for more, uh, more staff, more people to pull ropes, more people to pull uh, a sled. So the bottom line is it took 12 hours to, from the time of the injury to get to the emergency room. So it takes a long time, a long time to gather the rescuers, gather the gear, figure out what, the, what kind of equipment they need, and then get to the, to the subject. Now, it turns out that just a couple of weeks ago, um, a rescue happened on Mount St. Helens that they used a snowmobile. Now, snowmobiles aren't allowed in wilderness. So on Mount Hood, we're not allowed to use snowmobiles in the wilderness area, but Mount St. Helens is not a wilderness area. So in this particular situation, the uh, volcano rescue team was able to get to the victim quicker than usual because they had a snowmobile at their disposal. Um, I don't know if, they're, if they have a snowmobile regularly available to them, but they did a few weeks ago. So the point is, if you can self-rescue, if there's any way, any way you can get back to the car on your own, you're going to be way ahead of the game uh, than waiting for rescuers to come um, who are you know, ha living their lives, um, having to drive an hour or two to get there, gather all their gear, and then for, try to uh, get to your location. So the timeline is unbelievable. Um, so the last rescue I did was up on Mount Hood in the Luthal Calore. Um, that woman it was injured around nine o'clock, I think. We finally got, so we got the call around 10. We got there about noon. Took another at least 45 minutes to an hour to gather all the gear we needed. It was a difficult rescue, so we needed multiple ropes, a lot of equipment, um, uh, sleds to get to her. Um, then uh, we took the snowcat to the top of the Palmer. Then we had to ski over to her. Uh, I mean, so even though the injury happened around nine or so, she got back to Timberland Lodge right at dusk, right at dusk. So rescues are very time consuming, very tedious for the victim. So always try to figure out a way to get down by yourself if you possibly can. I think that's the answer to that. Here's some standard items. Try not to move around. It's hard, hard to find somebody who keeps moving around. Shelter, keep warm, 
hydration, food. Often what happens in a in a in a, in a rescue in emergency situation is somebody has been climbing all day and they've been taking pictures. So when something happens, their phone is often, you know, almost dead. So I always tell the people that um, most people should keep their phones off. One person or two person or three can take the pictures. And then when their phone dies and other people will have a fresh phone. So everybody does not need their phone on all the time. And so in a group, it's best if several of you uh, keep your phones off um, so that if, if you need them in an emergency situation, you'll have phones that work. Um, uh, I've, there's been many situations when phone cells die right when you most need them. Um, very frustrating for the victims and for the rescuers. Um, I think that's about there. It, one, one of the bullet points is keep up morale. <laughs> one of the best ways to keep up morale is to start a fire. You can't believe what a fire does for morale. Now, a fire would be pretty hard up on top of um, Mount St. Helens, but if you get back in the forest, it takes a little bit of work, but you can make a fire in the wintertime. There's ways to get her, to do that. And if you don't know how to start a fire in the wintertime, that'd be something to learn um, for even hiking. You don't have to be a mountain climber to um, uh, where making a fire in the wintertime would be a very useful thing. Um, and I can't think of a better morale builder than having a fire. These are probably almost um, obvious, but um, sometimes people want to be do too much and they get in our way. So offer to help, but uh, we'll we'll let you know if we need you. And now when we're just about the end of our talk, um, I would like to say that Port Mountain Rescue is always looking for volunteers. In fact, we, we recruit every other year. We have a two year cycle of teaching people what they need to know. Um, you don't need to, we just need to be an, an average mountaineer to join. We don't need exceptional people, but we need people willing to go out when conditions are not good, to leave their home when they'd rather not. Um, for the help of your colleagues, for the people in the mountains who, who uh, need you. In fact, that's how I got involved in Portland Mountain Rescue when uh, my wife needed rescuing. Okay, um, by the way, the, uh, the website there has um, information on how to, to apply for Portland Mountain Rescue. Um, I encourage you to do that before June 1st, which is the cutoff for applications. But the more the merrier. We can always use more people. Thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> Hopefully this is, I'm getting dark. Hopefully this has been uh, helpful for you. I'm certainly willing to answer questions for as long as people want to ask. Perfect. We have a couple questions already queued up. Um, we had someone ask a question about if you have any experience skinning up Mount St. Helens, I would assume on skis. So in the winter time, that is probably the preferred way to go, but most people will walk. And, and I do have skins and I've skinned up Mount Hood as far as the hogs back, but I'm, I could only skin up Mount St. Helens under perfect conditions. I'm, I'm an average skier. And so, um, and I usually lead people who are not on skis. So I normally don't go, go on skis, but um, if under perfect con conditions, if the snow is just right for me, um, yeah, I could do that. Um, and do you know if overnight parking or camping in the parking lot is allowed at Marble Mountain Snow Park? It is allowed. Uh, often people come up the night before and, uh, and camp, although it's not warm. <laughs> it's not warm. Very common, though. Um, okay. We had someone say that they are used to starting big mountain hikes between 2 and 3 a.m. They've never actually tried going later. Is there a particular downfall or benefit on Mount St. Helens to starting early aside from starting the first few hours in the dark and trying to catch a sunrise? 
I hear from others that it's important to start extra early for mountains like Hood to avoid catching too much ice fall later in the day, but that seems like that isn't the case on Mount St. Helens. Yeah, they are really two different mountains. So in the, in the summer route, it takes about an hour, hour and a half to get to the um, lava flow. And I would not want to go through the lava flow in the dark. You're using your hands. It's, it's rough. If you fall, it's really easy to cut yourself. So uh, on that sharp, those sharp rocks. So I would not want to do that in the dark. In the winter route, the first, it's, again, it's about an hour out of the trees. Um, and if you really know your way, um, you know, root finding is always an issue. But if, you, you're from, if you're familiar with the path and you can find it in the dark, no, there's no reason not to, you can go earlier in the wintertime. Cool. Um, are there any, do you have any recommendations for courses to take after an Airy One or an Avalanche Level One course? if they want to climb Pacific Northwest volcanoes? Well, if you've taken an Airy One course, you can climb, that's enough for all the volcanoes. You don't need more than that. Now, all the volcanoes are different. As we just talked about in Mount Hood, you start early, at least in the, in the spring. In the winter, you can start Hood in, in, in five or 6 a.m. Um, but you don't do that on Adams. You don't do that on um, St. Helens. You do start early on Rainier. Um, I would start early on Baker. Shasta is not so much matters. Um, so yeah, every mountain has its unique characteristics to decide whether you want to leave early or whether you need to start really early, oh, dark hundred or, or, or not. Sure. I think that question might have been asking about like any further education after an avalanche course or in tandem with an avalanche course for climbing the volcanoes. Well, I'm a member of the Mazamas. I've been a Mazama in, for 20 years. So Mazamas teach all, they don't teach avalanche courses, but they teach all kinds of mountaineering courses, beginner, intermediate, advanced. So I'm, and of course there's Airy 2 courses for further, um, um, avalanche awareness. So I, I've just spoken to a, a person who just took an, uh, the Airy 2 and because of so many deaths recently, they've changed the course of avalanche. They're, they, they're kind of bisected. They have, there's a path more towards teaching it and there's more of a pathway towards not teaching but just becoming more and more aware. So a, a path for the people who want to teach course and those who just want to be aware, aware of it. But there's always more to learn. Um, I've never taken an area to myself. I haven't really needed that. My, my advice is to stay out of avalanche terrain. <laughs> I know enough now that I know what I don't know. And um, I know what avalanche terrain is and I stay out of it when I can. Having said that, as I talked about recently, the, a ridge is a safe place to go. So one can go part way up Mount St. Helens without any concerns about avalanche. So that route is a low risk route, at least, you know, a third of the way or half the way up the mountain. Um, someone else said they have a permit for May 18th. Should they plan on snowshoeing? Uh, May 18th, there's going to be snow up there. Not, not low down, but higher up, but probably not snowshoes. That, this will be snow that will have been thawed and frozen and thawed and frozen. So uh, snowshoes are for, you know, fresher snow. So I definitely, though, would be taking either micro spikes or crampons. Um, and so what else asked, so they have a permit for the last week in April. Do you have any experience with the likely conditions within that time frame of winter route versus summer route distinction? Well, this year, the Climbers Bivouac will not be open in a couple of weeks. There's, there's, it's a, it's a good snow year. So you will be leaving from the Barbell Mountain Snow Park. And in May, uh, sorry, in a couple of weeks, you probably won't be uh, any snow at the parking lot. You probably won't hit snow for a couple hours. Uh, but I would probably take, um, I would probably take snowshoes and crampons uh, in April. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Are there any, oh, another questions? Uh, oh, well, someone asked kind of more specific about webinars. 
uh, are we planning to have similar Zoom webinars like this one for other Oregon Washington mountains? Um, we did have one on Mount Hood a couple weeks ago and it's on our YouTube channel. Um, and then we'll probably have one on Mount Adams a little bit later in the season once that trailhead thaws out. Um, I think it's probably four to six miles still from the trailhead that's full of snow. So not quite Mount Adams season yet, unless you have, you want a really long day. <laughs> you know, I have one little secret. It turns out that the town of Cougar on the way to Mount St. Helens has heated public restrooms. Ooh. It's, always, it's always cold at the Marble Mountain Snow Park or at Clemmer's Bivouac. So we usually meet at the public restrooms in Cougar and they're warm. That's where we get organized, figure out what, um, what gear we might need, put on our layers there. So when we get to the car, we don't have to sit around and get dressed and things. We, we can be ready to go. And so um, I'm thankful to the town of Cougar for having heated public restrooms year round. So don't forget to use them there. Awesome. <laughs> that's my little secret. Oh, that's a good one. That's a great tip. And that's what, like 20, 20, 30 minutes before you get to the trailhead? It's not too far out, maybe in even fact, closer. In fact, uh, in terms of avalanche, since it's wintertime, you need avalanche training. Everybody carries avalanche beacons. That's actually where I do a quick have a beacon uh, practice at those public restrooms because they're warm while people are standing around. And we do, and it's usually dark in the winter time there where we start early. So we do a quick uh, beacon practice there because most people don't practice using their beacons very often during the year. And this just gives them a, a little bit of a, oh yeah, that's how it works before we actually head on up. So that's a good place to uh, just kind of get organized and do what you need to do. Um, but it's where I also do a short beacon practice before we head up. Perfect. All right. Well, if there's no more questions, do you have any final thoughts or last words, Michael? Well, there's a lot to do on Mount St. Helens. And of course, I've mentioned snowshoeing. I even mentioned Nordic skiing and climbing is a wonderful thing. And um, Mount St. Helens is probably the best mountain to get started on if you want to start climbing the volcanoes. Well, South Sister would be a similar thing, but you, uh, you can't really climb that in the wintertime. The access is too far away. Yes. Um, cool. Well, that is all we've got tonight, guys. Thank you everyone for joining and thank you, Michael, for taking the time out of your evening to do this awesome information clinic on Mount St. Helens. Um, thanks everyone of, for- uh, Okay, there's a lot of information on the web. So um, uh, yes. the more you know about before you climb, the better. Yes. Um, and thanks everyone in the audience for participating and asking questions. We hope this webinar was informative and inspires you to learn more about the volcano and expand your mountaineering knowledge to get out and explore this national scenic, national volcanic monument. Um, and with that, I will say thank you again, everyone, and have a good night. Um, thank you for inviting me. Good night. Good night.